Hey, Lunarnet. It's Matt here for the Dork Lords. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We talk about all manner of dorkly things here, so whether it's sci-fi, fantasy, superheroes, we probably have a playlist about it. Feel free to check us out. Today is another in our Dork Lord of the Rings series. And today's topic comes to us from commenter Noncare, who requested a video about Mathros, the Elven King. If you've come to Tolkien through the films, uh, the name Mathros may not be familiar to you, but uh, he plays a critical part in the Silmarillion. He is one of the sons of Feanor, uh, and is a very complex, complicated character. Is he a villain? Is he a tragic hero? Is he a little of both? Um, I'll give you the background and you can decide. Uh, one note is, when researching Mathros, there are so many relevant quotes, I couldn't fit them into one video. So this is going to be part one of two. Part one's going to take us into the First Age, right up before the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. And in part two, I will look at Mathros's life through the rest of the First Age. First, let's get into part one. As I mentioned, Mathros is one of the sons of Feanor. Not just one of the sons, he's the eldest son. Very important because Feanor becomes High King of the Noldor. Obviously, the eldest son would be next in line. And in fact, yes, at some point, Mathros, for a short time, becomes High King of the Noldor. Here's a brief description from the Silmarillion of each of the seven sons of Feanor. The seven sons of Feanor were Mathros the Tall, Maglor the Mighty Singer, whose voice was heard far over land and sea, Kelegorm the Fair, and Caranthir the Dark, Curafin the Crafty, who inherited most his father's skill of hand, and the youngest, Amrod and Amras, who were twin brothers alike in mood and face. So there you go, the seven sons of Feanor Mathros is your eldest son. It's called Mathros the Tall. It suggests that he's tall even for an elf. We know he's got red hair, and he inherits that hair from his grandfather on his mother's side. His mom, Nerdanel, her dad's name is Machtan. Machtan is a red-haired elf. Red hair, a bit unusual for elves. He also has a beard, which is unusual for elves. Mactan actually trained at smithing under the Vala Aule. So if you were going to learn smithing, that's the entity you'd want to learn from. You know, Aule is somewhat like the, the Roman god Vulcan. You know, he, he's all about smithing. And so he teaches Mactan how to smith metal and stone. In fact, Mactan wears a copper circlet. His favorite metal is copper, maybe because of the color and matches his hair. And just, just a guess there. So Mactan is, is very skilled, you know, learn from the best. And he imparts some of this wisdom at uh, smithing metal and stone to Feanor, his son-in-law. He comes later to regret that because Feanor then creates a secret forge and he forges some of the first weapons in Valinor. So that was not Mactan's intent, uh, but Feanor takes that knowledge and makes weapons. But that's where Mathros's red hair comes from. The name Mathros uh, means pale glitter, which considering how much of Mathros's life and death are interconnected with the Silmaril gems, perhaps pale glitter uh, evokes that connection. So we're still in the years of the trees. So before the first age even. So thousands and thousands of years before the third age, the War of the Ring, all that stuff. Morgoth kills Mathros's granddad, Finve, and steals the Silmaril gems that Feanor had crafted. So Feanor's dad has been murdered, and his most prized possession, the thing, the Silmaril gems, he's got an unhealthy obsession with them. They are stolen by Morgoth, who then heads to Middle-earth. In his sheer rage at what has transpired, Feanor, who also feels aggrieved by the Valar, like he's been constrained by them, makes this oath that he is going to get these gems back at whatever the cost. And his sons, including Mathros, make that oath with him. Uh, here is that oath. Then Feanor swore a terrible oath. 
His seven sons leapt straight away to his side, and took the self-same vow together, and red as blood shone their drawn swords in the glare of the torches. They swore an oath which none shall break, and none should take, by the name even of Iluvatar, calling the everlasting dark upon them if they kept it not. And Manve they named in witness, and Varda, vowing to pursue with vengeance and hatred to the ends of the world, Vala, demon, elf, or man as yet unborn, or any creature, great or small, good or evil, that time should bring forth unto the end of days, whoso should hold or take or keep a Silmaril from their possession. Thus spoke Mathros and Maglor and Kelegorm, Curafin and Caranthir, Emrod and Amros, princes of the Noldor, and many quailed to hear the dread words, for so sworn, good or evil, an oath may not be broken, and it shall pursue oath-keeper and oath-breaker to the world's end. This is the moment that changes Mathros' life forever. As you see there at the end of that quote, Tolkien writes, an oath may not be broken. It shall pursue oath-keeper and oath-breaker to the world's end. Uh, this is a huge deal. If you think about um, the oath that we see in Lord of the Rings, the men of Dunharrow were the, known as the Oath Breakers because they'd made an oath to Isildur to help him in times of trouble. They didn't answer the call, and so they were basically cursed to this half-life existence in the mountains until Aragorn, an heir of Isildur, released them of their vow, that they, they fulfilled their vow. Similar type of oath here. And you might wonder, like, well, why did all the sons just jump in and volunteer on this oath? I think a couple of reasons. One would be just the peer pressure of the moment, right? It's their dad. Their, their grandfather has been murdered. And he is calling upon them to join in this oath. You're not going to be the one son who's like, nah, I'm, I'm all right. Like, Oof. So I think there was an immense pressure to take the oath. Also, maybe they didn't realize exactly what this oath meant. In the moment, it just means, hey, Morgoth killed your granddad and he stole these incredibly valuable artifacts. We're going to go get them from that guy. And maybe in their minds they thought, well, sure, yeah, I don't like Morgoth. Yes, we'll go fight Morgoth. Didn't necessarily think of that part where it was the <laughs> elf or man unborn or Vala. It doesn't matter who's got them. You know, maybe I was kind of like, yeah, that's like legal mumbo jumbo. But really, it's Morgoth, right? Right, we're all, okay, great. For whatever reason, everyone joined in this oath, including Mathros. And that sets their paths definitely for the worse for all of them. Right away, we see some atrocities committed on behalf of this oath. Feanor needs boats to cross to Middle-earth. The Teleri have boats, but because it's against the will of the Valar, they don't want to give the boats, loan them, give them whatever, to Feanor. So Feanor takes them by force. And this is known as the first kin slaying. Teleri elves are killed off. Now, it's not specifically written that Mathros killed Teleri elves, but he almost certainly took part in the fighting. And he came out okay. I would have to think he probably killed some elves in this moment. And that act is viewed as practically a, a cardinal sin um, by the Valar. And they put out this Doom of Mandos, which is like a prophecy slash curse on Feanor and his followers and his sons. Uh, and it's, it's, a lot of it is wrapped up in this moment when they decide to kill their kin for some boats. So, Feanor's now got these boats. He is High King of the Noldor, and so he commands the Noldor to follow him to Middle-earth. And so the followers of his half-brother, Fingolfin, done a Fingolfin video, elven hero, uh, they agree, or it's a little bit reluctantly, but they agree that they're going to follow Feanor to Middle-earth. Feanor does not like Fingolfin. You know, threatened him with a sword at one point. And so he actually decides that he is just going to go on ahead with these boats and leave Fingolfin and his people to their own devices. In the middle of the night, 
he steals the ships and they sail across the channel over to Middle Earth. That's Maethros, that's Feanor, all of Feanor's people. Whoop! They go under cover of darkness, leaving Fingolfin's people behind on the shore on the west. So they arrive at the shoreline. Now, Maethros is very good friends with Fingolfin's son, Fingon. You're going to see this friendship play out over the course of the remaining years here, the years of the trees and into the first age. And so that friendship comes to play here where Maethro says, well, we're going to send the ships back, right? They're going to, we're going to let them use them now. Uh, and here is his dad's reply. Now this is cool because we see a conversation between Maethros and his dad. But when they were landed, Maethros, the eldest of his sons, and on a time, the friend of Fingon, ere Morgoth's lies came between, spoke to Feanor, saying, Now what ships and rowers will you spare to return? And whom shall they bear hither first? Fingon the valiant? Then Feanor laughed as one fay, and he cried, None and none. What I have left behind I count now no loss. Needless baggage on the road it has proved. Let those that cursed my name curse me still, and whine their way back to the cages of the Valar. Let the ships burn. Then Maethros alone stood aside. But Feanor caused fire to be set to the white ships of the Teleri. So in that place, which was called Lasgar, ended the fairest vessels that ever sailed the sea, in a great burning, bright and terrible. So here we see one of the first instances where Maethros is at odds with his dad. Feanor leaves Fingolfin and his people behind. It's basically like good riddance. Burns these ships, some of the, the greatest ships ever crafted. Just burns them so that no one else can use them. And this act is actually what leads to a bunch of elven deaths because Fingolfin doesn't go back. Fingolfin's like, no, no. Nope, I said I was going to follow my leader, Feanor, and follow him I will. And so they go across this, hell, the Hel Karakse. It's a, like a land bridge, similar to like the Bering Strait. It's incredibly perilous, um, and just a whole bunch of elves die en route. And the reason they died is because they weren't able to take boats. It's this needless loss of life, uh, thanks to Feanor uh, and this oath. Also, we see this friendship between... Fingon, son of Fingolfin, and Maethros, son of Feanor. It's very, very important for later. So, Fingolfin's people are still taking a long way around to try to get to Middle-earth. Meanwhile, Feanor and his people, including Maethros, are in Middle-earth, and they are waging war on Morgoth's forces. Feanor is killed. He's killed by Gothmog, Lord of the Balrogs, and he does so in sight of his sons. So Maethros witnesses the death of his dad. There in the land of Morgoth, Feanor was surrounded with few friends about him. Long he fought on and undismayed, though he was wrapped in fire and wounded with many wounds. And at the last he was smitten to the ground by Gothmog, lord of Balrogs. There he would have perished, had not his sons in that moment come up with force to his aid. And the Balrogs left him and departed to Angband. Then his sons raised up their father and bore him back towards Mithrim. But as they were upon the upward path to the pass over the mountains, Feanor bade them halt, for his wounds were mortal, and he knew that his hour was come. With his last sight he beheld far off the peaks of Thangorodrum, mightiest of the towers of Middle-earth, and knew with the foreknowledge of death that no power of the Noldor would ever overthrow them. But he cursed the name of Morgoth thrice, and laid it upon his sons to hold to their oath, to avenge their father. Then he died. But he had neither burial nor tomb, for so fiery was his spirit that as it sped his body fell to ash and was borne away like smoke, and his likeness has never again appeared in Arda. Neither has his spirit left the halls of Mendos. Thus ended the mightiest of the Noldor, of whose deeds came both their greatest renown and their most grievous woe." Wow, so this is a huge moment. 
Feanor takes on Gothmog and a bunch of Balrogs uh, unaided. Gothmog mortally wounds him before he can finish him off. Sons run in, temporarily save the day, are trying to get their father back to safety. Their father, Feanor, realizes he is going to die, so he makes them stop, and he makes them renew that oath. Right? Remember what you promised! Everlasting darkness! And there's that quote that says, He knew with the foreknowledge of death that no power of the Noldor would ever overthrow the towers of Thangorondrum. So he knows it's impossible, but he still makes his sons renew that oath as he lays dying. Sons, uh, I command you to do the impossible. Uh, now I die. Look. So, also his death, very interesting, right? Uh, turns to ash and smoke. Just psh, disappears. And his spirit goes to the halls of Mandos, kind of like purgatory, essentially. Uh, and because of these acts, because of the oath, because of the kin slaying, he was never released from purgatory, and so he will be there to the end of time. So this was the end of Feanor. And, you know, again, <laughs> your dad reminds you of this oath you took right before turning into ash and disappearing into smoke. You know, it, it has an impact on you. So, Maethros is now the High King of the Noldor. His dad turned to ash. He immediately became High King, eldest son, but right away, his reign and his life are threatened. But even in the hour of the death of Feanor, an embassy came to his sons from Morgoth, acknowledging defeat and offering terms, even to the surrender of a Silmaril. Then Maethros the Tall, the eldest son, persuaded his brothers to feign to treat with Morgoth and to meet his emissaries at the place appointed. But the Noldor had as little thought of faith as he. Wherefore, each embassy came with greater force than was agreed. But Morgoth sent the more, and there were Balrogs. Maethros was ambushed, and all his company were slain. But he himself was taken back alive by the command of Morgoth, and brought to Angband. Then the brothers of Maethros drew back and fortified a great camp in Hithlum. But Morgoth held Maethroth as hostage, and sent word that he would not release him unless the Noldor would forsake their war, returning into the west. But the sons of Feanor knew that Morgoth would betray them, and would not release Maethroth whatsoever they might do. And they were constrained also by their oath, and might not for any cause forsake the war against their enemy. Therefore, Morgoth took Maethros and hung him from the face of a precipice upon Thangorodrum, and he was caught to the rock by the wrist of his right hand in a band of steel. So this terrible moment, witnessing the death and the incineration of his father, gets worse fast. All right? Newly High King Maethros gets this offer of surrender from Morgoth. He knows it's a trap. And it is a trap, um, and decides, look, this is if we want the Silmaril, maybe we we lure Morgoth out, and we you know we get the Silmarils that way, you know we 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 trick him into thinking, oh yeah, we're playing along, but we're not playing along. All right, so so both Morgoth and Maethros show up at this meeting, this truce meeting, not intending to abide by the truce. There's Balrogs, and the Balrogs make the difference, and Maethros's forces are. Are destroyed. Maethro is captured, hung up from Thangaradrum, and you know Morgoth says, "Hey, if you guys leave, I'll I'll let him down." And oath or no oath, I think the brothers probably made the right choice there, right? That's uh, Morgoth wasn't going to hold to his word, so uh, they they don't leave. Now this is a little odd because if you look at the timeline, Maethro is hanging by his wrist from Thangaradrum for about 30 years. I don't know how, how he eats, how he survives in that way. I don't know that that's in, we're supposed to know. Some, he's up there for a long time, let's put it that way. This is the High King of the Noldor, of the Elves, hanging by his wrist from Thangaradrum as a warning to leave. So finally, Fingolfin's people arrive in Middle-earth. And this is basically the beginning of the First Age. In the year five of the First Age, 
Fingon, who as we mentioned is friends with Maethros, decides to attempt to rescue Maethros, very dangerous mission in enemy territory, is gonna to try to rescue Maethros in order to try to unite these two families. Then Fingon the Valiant, son of Fingolfin, resolved to heal the feud that divided the Noldor before their enemy should be ready for war. Long before in the bliss of Valinor, before Melkor was unchained or lies came between them, Fingon had been close in friendship with Maethros, and though he knew not yet that Maethros had not forgotten him at the burning of the ships, the thought of their ancient friendship stung his heart. Therefore, he dared a deed which is justly renowned among the feats of the princes of the Noldor. Alone, and without the counsel of any, he set forth in search of Maethros, and aided by the very darkness that Morgoth had made, he came unseen into the fastness of his foes. Then in defiance of the orcs, who cowered still in the dark vaults beneath the earth, he took his harp and sang a song of Valinor that the Noldor made of old, before strife was born among the sons of Fiendve. And his voice rang in the mournful hollows that had never heard before aught save cries of fear and woe. Thus Fingon found what he sought, for suddenly above him, far and faint, his song was taken up, and a voice answering called to him. Maethros it was that sang amid his torment. But Fingon climbed to the foot of the precipice where his kinsmen hung, and then could go no further, and he wept when he saw the cruel device of Morgoth. So Fingon, alone, comes to Thangaradrum, is thwarted by the landscape. In desperation, he sings the song of the Noldor, and the song is answered by Maethros. Fingon looks up, sees Maethros, but realizes there is no way he can get to him. Maethros, therefore, being in anguish without hope, begged Fingon to shoot him with his bow. And Fingon strung an arrow and bent his bow. And seeing no better hope, he cried to Manve, saying, O king, to whom all birds are dear, speed now this feathered shaft and recall some pity for the Noldor in their need. His prayer was answered swiftly, for Manve, to whom all birds are dear, had sent forth the race of eagles, commanding them to dwell in the crags of the north and to keep watch upon Morgoth. For Manve still had pity for the exiled elves. Now, even as Fingon bent his bow, there flew down from the high airs Thorondor, king of eagles, mightiest of all birds that have ever been. And staying Fingon's hand, he took him up and bore him to the face of the rock where Maethros hung. But Fingon could not release the hell-wrought bond upon his wrist, nor sever it, nor draw it from the stone. Again, therefore, in his pain, Maethros begged that he would slay him. But Fingon cut off his hand above the wrist, and Thrandor bore them back to Mithrin. There Maethros in time was healed, for the fire of life was hot within him, and his strength was of the ancient world, such as those possessed who were nurtured in Valinor. His body recovered from his torment and became hale, but the shadow of his pain was in his heart, and he lived to wield his sword with left hand more deadly than his right had been. By this deed, Fingon won great renown, and all the Noldor praised him. So this is a huge moment in Tolkien's mythology. High King of the Noldor is rescued by Fingon, son of Fingolfin, and with the help of Thrandor, uh, Lord of the Eagles. I've done a Thrandor video, you can check that out. The pathos of that moment when Maethros is begging Fingon just to put him out of his misery. Just shoot me, you know, I'm done for. And that idea of dying to spare yourself the pain uh, is gonna come up again for Maethros. Uh, that is actually gonna be in part two of our little mini-series, but just put a pin in that. So Maethros has been saved, not by his brothers, but by Fingon. And so as an act of goodwill, he gives the crown to Fingolfin, Fingon's dad. And the hatred between the houses of Fingolfin and Feanor was assuaged, for Maethros begged forgiveness 
for the desertion in Araman. And he waived his claim to kingship over all the Noldor, saying to Fingolfin, If there lay no grievance between us, Lord, still the kingship would rightly come to you, the eldest here of the house of Finve, and not the least wise. But to this his brothers did not all in their hearts agree. So Mathros has just passed over the kingship. He's given it away. His brother's not crazy about it, but you know what? To, to Mathros' credit, they go along with it, right? They, they probably could have fought him over this because that's also their right that he's passing off. But this is where the kingship of the Noldor passes from the sons of Feanor to Fingolfin and his sons. So now we're a couple of years after the rescue of Mathros. It's the year seven of the First Age. <laughs> it's funny to say that, the year seven. Mathros and his brothers are looking for a place to settle. And they attempt to go to Doriath, uh, where King Thingol lives. King Thingol, not a fan of the sons of Feanor, and he lets them know it in no uncertain terms. Here's a conversation we hear between Thingol and Mathros. Now King Thingol welcomed not with a full heart the coming of so many princes in might out of the west, eager for new realms, and he would not open his kingdom. Beware, therefore, how you princes of the west bear yourselves. For I am the lord of Beleriand, and all who seek to dwell there shall hear my word. Into Doriath none shall come to abide, but only such as I call as guests, or who seek me in great need. Cold seemed its welcome to the Noldor, and the sons of Feanor were angered at the words. But Mathros laughed, saying, A king is he that can hold his own, or else his title is vain. Thingol does but grant us lands where his power does not run. Indeed, Doriath alone would be his realm this day, but for the coming of the Noldor. Therefore in Doriath let him reign, and be glad that he has the sons of Finve for his neighbors, not the orcs of Morgoth that we found. Elsewhere it shall go as seems good to us. Mathros restrained his brothers, and soon afterwards they left Mithram and went eastward to the wide lands about the hill of Himring. That region was named thereafter the March of Mathros, for northwards there was little defense of hill or river against assault from Angband. There Mathros and his brothers kept watch, gathering all such people as would come to them, and they had few dealings with their kinsfolk westward, save at need. It is said indeed that Mathros himself devised this plan to lessen the chances of strife, and because he was very willing that the chief peril of assault should fall upon himself, and he remained for his part in friendship with the houses of Fingolfin and Finarfin, and would come among them at times for common counsel. Yet he was also bound by the oath, though it slept now for a time. Mathros and his brothers get rebuffed by Thingol. The brothers are very angry. Let's face it, Feanor's family hot-tempered. Mathros talks some sense into them though, and is like, all right, all right, fine. We'll go find our own place. And they go east. He creates a fortress at Himring. Partially, he sets up that far away to avoid strife with the other elves. He mentions that for his part, he still is committed to this friendship with uh, Fingolfin. And he wants to take on the peril presented by Morgoth. He wants to be the defender of the elves in this moment. I think there's part of that is still this guilt over abandoning Fingolfin, over the kin slaying. He wants to do the right thing in this moment. We'll see a little bit more of him wanting to do the right thing in the year 20. So 13 years later, the year 20, Fingolfin decides, you know what, there is all this strife happening between the elves. Why don't we have this big feast, the Feast of Reuniting? They call it the Merith Adarthad. And he invites all the elves, and a lot of them come. Some of uh, the sons of Feanor do not come to this feast, but Mathros and the second oldest brother, Maglor, do attend this feast of reuniting. A lot of fences get mended here, and there's a, a sense of that camaraderie is coming back with the elves. And I think this moment is something that plays into Mathros's mind a little bit later, as we'll see that he attempts to do something similar 
after Fingolfin passes away. But for now, Fingolfin is still the High King. He's brought a lot of his people together, and their forces are growing stronger. Morgoth decides maybe it's time to do a surprise attack and, uh, you know, take these elves down a peg while I still can. So this is in the year 60. So 40 years after that Feast of Reuniting, Morgoth tries to do a sneak attack. Now Morgoth made trial of the strength and watchfulness of his enemies. Once more, with little warning, his might was stirred, and suddenly there were earthquakes in the north, and fire came from fissures in the earth, and the iron mountains vomited flame, and orcs poured forth across the plain. But Fingolfin and Maethros were not sleeping. They came upon the main host from either side as it was assaulting Dorthonion, and they defeated the servants of Morgoth, and pursuing them, destroyed them utterly to the least and last, within sight of Angband's gates. That was the third great battle of the wars of Beleriand, and it was named Dagur Aglareb, the Glorious Battle. So this shows you what the elves can do when they're united, right? Fingolfin and Maethros do like a pincer move and just wipe out the orcs, follow them to Angband, and kill every single one of them within sight of Angband's gates. This starts the siege of Angband. This is where they lay siege, and Morgoth has kept at bay for hundreds of years. I think about 400 years go by. And so this is the start of a, of, of a really good time here in the First Age for the Elves. Maybe they're even thinking, did we, did we defeat the Doom of Mandos? Did, this, did we just, you know, overcome prophecy? Uh, you know, maybe. <laughs> you know, they've got to be a little hopeful in this moment. And it, it all is seeming... Uh, right with the world. As another mark of atonement, we see that Maethros gives a very valuable gift to Fingolfin and Fingon. Fingolfin and Fingon, his son, held Hithlam. Their chief fortress was at Ithil Syrian, and their cavalry rode upon that plain even to the shadow of Thangaradrum. For from few, their horses had increased swiftly. Of those horses, Many of the sires came from Valinor, and they were given to Fingolfin by Maethros in atonement for his losses, for they had been carried by ship to Losgar. So Maethros gives to Fingolfin these horses that were sired in Valinor, horses of the West. You'd have to think that uh, the horse that Fingolfin eventually rides for his one-on-one -on -one duel with Morgoth, that horse's name is Rochalor. That horse has to be one of these, right? That's, that's one of these uh, sired in Valinor uh, super horses for a cavalry. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what you want. And it's interesting, that line that says, they were given by Maethros in atonement for his losses, for they had been carried by ship to Lascar. That suggests to me that they were on the ships that eventually got burned. What Maethros is saying is, I'm giving you these horses because once upon a time, we valued these horses more than we valued you. We put the horses on the ships. We left you. And so now I am attempting to make amends by saying that, indeed, I value you and I value our friendship. So I mentioned that Maethros built his fortress at Himring, the Hill of Himring. Here's a little bit more on that. The chief citadel of Maethros was upon the hill of Himring, the ever-cold. Between Himring and Darthonion there was a pass exceeding deep upon the west, and that was the pass of Aglon, and was a gate unto Doriath, and a bitter wind blew ever through it from the north. So I'm guessing that bitter wind is why Himring is called the ever-cold. So eventually, in the year 455, almost 400 years after the siege of Angband begins, the bad times come back. And there's the Dagger Bragaloch, the Battle of Sudden Flame. Morgoth comes out and crushes the elves. To his credit, Maethros is one of the few elves that actually comes out relatively unscathed. His fortress withstands these attacks. For the war had gone ill with the sons of Feanor, and well nigh all the east marches were taken by assault. Maethros did deeds of surpassing valor, and the orcs fled before his face. 
For since his torment upon Thangaradrum, his spirit burned like a white fire within, and he was as one that returns from the dead. Thus the great fortress upon the hill of Himring could not be taken, and many of the most valiant that remained, both of the people of Dorthonion and of the East Marches, rallied there to Maithros, and for a while he closed once more the pass of Aglon, so that the orcs could not enter Beleriand by that road. But they overwhelmed the riders of the people of Feanor upon Lothlin, for Glaurung came thither, and passed through Maglor's gap. Maglor joined Maithros upon Himring. So dark times for most of Elfdom. Maithros shows his valor in this moment. He had hoped that he could be a defender of the elves, that's why he set the fortress where he did, and in this moment, that's what he does. And the survivors are able to rally to him, including his brother, Maglor. Now, this may not surprise anyone, uh, but I have a map of Middle-earth as my desktop wallpaper. And as I was doing research on this, I remembered seeing Himring on the map of Middle-earth, but this is a Third Age War of the Ring map of Middle-earth. And indeed, Himring survives until the time of the War of the Ring. I'm going to read you a little bit from Unfinished Tales that just clarifies that, yep, it's the same place. I have shown the little island of Himling off the far northwestern coast, which appears on one of my father's sketch maps. Himling was the earlier form of Himring, the great hill on which Maithros, son of Feanor, had his fortress in the Silmarillion. And though the fact is nowhere referred to, it is clear that Himring's top rose above the waters that covered Drown Beleriand. So this is pretty awesome. There is an intact elven fortress just off the coast of Middle-earth at the time of the War of the Ring. This is very close to the Grey Havens, and it's probably 25 miles or less off the coast. You could see it. If you were standing on the coastline looking west, you would see this hill, the island, coming out of the water with an elven fortress on top. That, that fortress was never conquered. It was abandoned and probably eventually orcs maybe, uh, you know, garrisoned in it. But it was never torn down. It makes you wonder what's there, right? If I, you'd like to take a rowboat, paddle out, and just, you know, do some archaeology on, on this elven fortress. Uh, a great elven fortress that withstood all kinds of attacks. Well, you'd think there'd be some value in that in the Third Age, especially on that western coastline. Anyway, uh, people apparently were like, maybe it's haunted, I don't know. But back to the First Age. As I mentioned, 455, Dagger Bragaloch, dark times for the elves. The next year, 456, the High King, Fingolfin, rides off for that infamous one-on-one -on -one duel with Morgoth, dies which means that Fingon, his son, is now the High King, and the elves are trying to regroup. Obviously, Himring, still strong. You got various elves rallying to Himring for safety, and Maithros remembering how Fingolfin established that feast of reuniting. I think Maithros thinks it's up to him to maybe try to bring these elves again back together, and so he creates the Union of Maithros. And another event happens at this time to also give the elves some hope. And that event is that Baron and Luthien best Morgoth and get a Silmaril out of Angband. In the years after the Dagger Bragaloch and the fall of Fingolfin, the shadow of the fear of Morgoth lengthened. But in the 469th year after the return of the Noldor to Middle-earth, there was a stirring of hope among elves and men. For the rumor ran among them of the deeds of Baron and Luthien, and the putting to shame of Morgoth, even upon his throne in Angband. In that year also, the great councils of Maithros were almost complete, and with the reviving strength of the Eldar and the Edine, the advance of Morgoth was stayed, and the orcs were driven back from Beleriand. Then some began to speak of victories to come, and of redressing the battle of the Bragaloch when Maithros should lead forth the united hosts and drive Morgoth underground and seal the doors of Angband. But the wiser were uneasy still, fearing that Maithros revealed his growing strength too soon, 
and that Morgoth would be given time enough to take counsel against him. So this is that union of Mathros. Mathros combines not just elves, but elves and men and dwarves. And this union is very successful, but it does have some drawbacks. And that is because there are still some out there who do not trust the sons of Feanor. And I'm going to talk more about the failings of the union of Mathros and what happens after that in part two. But this is, I would say, the high point of Mathros's career. You know, uh, they've gotten past the Stagger Bragalach. He's brought his people together. They're uniting with the world of men and with dwarves. And there's a common purpose. And one of the Silmarils has been taken from Morgoth. All seems like maybe it could be right with the world again. Can Mathros be redeemed? Find out next time in part two of Mathros, Elven King. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Noncare, for suggesting this topic. If you've got a topic out there you'd like me to talk about, please feel free to put it in the comments. I'd be happy to do a video about a topic of your choosing. As I say, next time, it's Mathros, part two.